Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to a special uh, Wednesday edition of our live stream programming. I'm Sandy Campbell, Executive Director of the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Uh, and I hope you're having a great day out there. We have um, some exciting talks coming up, uh, as I'm sure many of you are well aware. We have, for example, tomorrow, we're going to uh, go over to Myanmar uh, virtually and speak with the former US Ambassador Derek Mitchell, uh, who uh, served in Myanmar under President Obama. And we'll also hear from a couple of folks on the ground uh, in Myanmar. Um, then on Wednesday, the 21st, we have our annual gala, of course, which is uh, we're calling the evolution of global education this year. We're going to talk all about educating uh, the next generation, high school and college students. We'll hear from a number of them. We have a few surprises up our sleeve. And then, of course, we have the big talk with uh, with uh, Jim Comey, former FBI director, see the Comey rule. If you haven't already, it's fascinating and gives such a different insight into, uh, into this man that was very different from my impression of uh, you know, reading the news during the 2016 election, for example. Uh, really interesting stuff, I highly recommend it. And then we've just launched this on April 24th and May 1st. Those are both Saturdays. We have our Global Citizen Summit. Um, this is the second one that we've done. And this year, of course, it's all live via Zoom. Uh, and on each of those Saturdays, we will have two sessions. Um, and they have all been designed and will be all run by our amazing high school fellows. And we'll be touching on all kinds of big, weighty topics going on around the world from transitional justice, looking at truth and reconciliation commissions, um, to genocide and reconciling from genocide, to some of the youth protests in Chile. And then the one I'm probably most looking forward to, we have uh, a young activist from Yemen who's going to talk all about child marriage in Yemen and the steps that she has taken to help highlight that issue and ultimately abolish child marriage. Um, so lots coming up as always. Um, we have another talk we just announced yesterday, or actually this morning, uh, is a great book called Mine, which looks at ownership, which is absolutely fascinating. It's slightly outside of the ambit of the things we normally do, but it touches on philosophy, on uh, you know these amazing new, um, what are they called, non-fungible tokens that people are buying in the millions of dollars to preserve a unique digital item. There's all kinds of fascinating ownership issues today. Uh, so that's on April 29th, and be sure to join us then. So that's uh, the end of what I have to say in terms of an introduction. And let me now uh, bring in today's speaker, Mary Beth Janke. Welcome to the program. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Let me read your bio really quickly, but sure. Dr. Mary Beth uh, Jenke is a former US Secret Service agent who's now a forensic and clinical pathologist. She's traveled an extraordinary path as one of a small minority of women in the Secret Service in the early 1990s and was the only female to ever officially protect a foreign president outside of the United States. Through this journey, she's gathered amazing insights into the level-headedness, self-confidence, and mental and physical toughness required to succeed in life. And Mary Beth has a great presentation for us, and we're going to have some questions, of course, as we go. And folks, you know where the Q&A button is, and enter your questions, and we'll get to them when the time comes. And uh, Mary Beth, why don't I turn things over to you right now? Sure. And just to say that I am actually a forensic and clinical psychologist, not a pathologist, so I'm a... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's okay. Listen, I would I would love to have the MD, but I have the uh, doctorate. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Are you um, going to put up the? Here we go. Okay, all set. Yeah, can you go to the next one? Keep going. Yep. There we go. So this is the way I've put this together. Really, it sort of divides out the years of my life and what I was doing during that time. And, you know, we started this about 15 minutes ago and Sandy and I were chatting just to make sure comms were okay. And he didn't realize that all the slides after this took place after my time in the secret service, which I will get into. So I was um, in fact, a special agent in the United States secret service. And you can see George Bush senior's picture there. So that was my era. So that gives you an idea how old I am. And I actually joined when I was, I mean, at the time it was considered a little bit older. I was almost 25 because I had uh, graduated college from Indiana University and I went to live in Spain um, because I had studied there my uh, junior year, second semester. And I was like, I graduated and I said, you know, I really want to be more bilingual. So I said to my parents, um, I'm going to go spend a summer so that I can learn more Spanish. And I ended up spending three years 
Um, and then I came back and I applied to both the Secret Service and the DEA. And uh, honestly, I would have gone with whoever called me first and it happened to be the Secret Service. Um, I applied first through the Chicago field office and then it, it transferred to the Washington field office because I moved there to get a job while they were processing my application. Um, Sandy had asked me earlier if I would share a little bit about the Secret Service. So of course, um, you know, what most people don't know because they only ever see us wearing really cool sunglasses and earpieces and suits, you know, protecting the president or the vice president or their families or maybe a former president is we actually started as an investigative uh, agency. We, we were created, um, God, I can't remember the year, 1820 something maybe, um, to, to uh, we had a huge issues with counter currency in the, in the country. So that's where we were started under the Department of Treasury. Uh, what ended up happening after 9-11, they put us under Homeland Security. So that was interesting. Um, I wish we were still under Treasury for a lot of reasons, but that's sort of irrelevant. When I was an agent, there were approximately 2000 Secret Service agents and 9% of us or 180 of us were women. Um, so not super common. Um, today, there's about 3,200 agents, and the percentage is somewhere between 13 and 15%. Um, and what I would say, and I think this is a little bit of a misnomer, is that they do hire women. Um, many of us, um, that was not my case, but many of the women that I trained with left to either get married, have children, have a more stable life. This is not a stable life. Um, I loved it. I thought it was, you know, adrenaline, uh, action, awesome training. I mean, I feel like I got the best training in the world and that carried me into the private sector, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you can see that this is years 91 to 92. And so is there just a little bit over one year. And, um, if you want to know why I only stayed for approximately a year and a month, you'll have to read my book, um, which was published last April. Um, so that's that. And one little tidbit, because I was in the Washington field office, George Bush Sr., they have the system whereby the family members, meaning his children, are offered protection. If they're over the age of 18, they're allowed to say thanks, but no thanks. George did not say no, but Dorothy did, and she was in the D.C. area, and she had two little kids, Ellie and Sam. And they were little at the time. And be, we rotated, being part of the Washington field office, we rotated about, I'd say I probably protected them about a week every month or every six weeks. And um, Ellie at the time was probably about seven. So this would have been George Bush Sr.'s granddaughter. And I was in my government car, we call it G-Ride. And Ellie, um, I was picking her up from school and uh, we were just chatting about her day. And she just looks at me and she goes, uh oh. And I was like, what, sweetheart? She had peed all over the passenger, the front passenger seat of my government car. And I just thought, I go, sweetheart, don't worry about it. You know, accidents happen. Um, I promise I won't tell you because she was so worried that all the boys, all my, my colleagues back in the command post would know what she did. I said, absolutely not. They will never know. Don't worry about it. And of course, I never told anybody. So just one of those little things that you think would not necessarily happen to a Secret Service agent, but it definitely did. Um, I'm good with this slide unless you have any more questions. Yeah, thank you. So when I left, I entered the, the world of private security and I really bounced back and forth between protection assignments and investigations. I'm talking mostly today about my protection assignments, mostly because that's what my book pertained to. Um, I may eventually write a second book that has to do with my life as an investigator, but towards the end of this presentation, I do talk about a pretty interesting investigation I did. So my years in the Secret Service ended in 92, and I my first protection assignment was through the Organization of American States. Now, the Organization of American States had never hired security before, but Lima at the time was considered pretty dangerous because as you can see, that is, I don't know if anybody knows that, but that is Abamael Guzman. He is, um, was the head of the Sendero Luminoso, um, the Shining Path. And two weeks before I went on this protection assignment, um, he was captured. So there's him behind his jail cell, his jail bars. Um, and what this was is the OAS um, in its traditional form was doing an election observation mission for two different sets of elections uh, for Peru. And they felt that it was such a huge liability because of all the bombing and um, the targeting of US companies and US um, efforts 
because even though it was a worldwide effort, because the OAS is stationed in the United States and Washington DC, it was perceived as a US effort. So they were targeting US companies, they were targeting US efforts. Um, and so they decided for the first time ever, they hired a team of eight security members and I was one of them. Um, and there were seven other men. Four of us stayed in the capital in Lima and then the other four went out to provinces where we had offices because they were doing election obser uh, um, observation. Now you can't really see in that picture at the top, but the gentleman with the black hat, he's next to me, I'm in that like light blue shirt. Um, he was my protectee. And I will tell you, you know, it probably still is, but I would say absolutely back in 92, 93, Peru was a very chauvinistic country. So there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't hear, oh, um, you must be the ambassador's um, girlfriend. Oh, you must be the ambassador's affair or you must be the ambassador's secretary. And every single time they would say that to me, I'd see like, oh, absolutely, yes, absolutely, you know? And when I've told this story before, um, people have said to me, well, weren't you offended? I said, no, if they think I'm somebody other than who I am, if anything were to happen, they wouldn't be looking to me to be the one carrying the weapon protecting my, my protectee who was the ambassador, the assigned ambassador from the Organization of American States. So, um, though that just was very funny to me. And, you know, I said to people, no, they didn't know I was the one carrying the nine millimeters. So for me, um, that was actually beneficial. You know, it could buy you a few seconds of time that could save both my life and my protectee's life. So, um, yeah, I'm good with that slide if you are. Sure. Well, what, who were you protect? It was an ambassador that you were protecting? So the OES, yeah, the OES, this man was actually Colombian. Um, his name was Mario. I can't remember his last name, but he was assigned by the OES and he was considered an ambassador. But like, you know, to us in the United States, we wouldn't have known him, nor would he have had security. But in this role as capacity as being the head of the election mission for the Organization of American States, he was given ambassador status. And honestly, in, in Peru, he was considered a king. I mean, he got, and, and, and I, benef I benefited from that because, um, you know, they, we got to see the, the lines of Nazca, if you guys know that's a, um, a heritage site. Um, we got to fly around in a helicopter and see the Lineas de Nazca. We got to go to Machu Picchu. I mean, we did everything that you can imagine, but that was because he was considered sort of like this God in some ways. Um, and when he interviewed me, he interviewed everybody that became part of his security team. And it was me and the gentleman that you see on that bottom right picture. Um, he was my partner, he's a former special forces um, operator. And we were the two that protected him. The other people had different protection um, responsibilities. But when he interviewed me in Spanish, um, he got up from the interview and he said to the people that were running the contract, he said, hire her there is no protection like the protection of a woman. Um, and I think he recognized that that would have been a, that was a huge asset in a country like Peru, because again, people wouldn't know that it was me carrying the nine millimeter protecting him. Right. Yeah. And I guess even being a woman in a macho society, they would never suspect you of being the one no. who gives you the mm -hmm. advantage. 100%. Next, Next slide. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so this is two different eras. You can see the 94 to 95 was the Dart family and then 96 to 97 was Mary Kay. So I'll explain both. 94 to 95, if you raise up a styrofoam glass, a styrofoam cup, you'll typically see Dart, Solo, or Sweetheart. The Darts are actually a family. Um, uh, the senior uh, Dart is actually the person who has the patent on what's now called styrofoam. He went to, I believe it was University of Michigan. Um, he created a huge um, conglomerate, a huge company called Dart Container Corporation. He had three sons, Ken, Robert, and Thomas. Ken was the family that I was protecting. What, what Senior did was create, made them millionaires. Ken Dart, the family that I protected based in Sarasota, Florida, he was not really involved in the day-to-day. -day. He was involved in investing and he made them billionaires. Now, what happened that necessitated them um, for them needing protection was that there was, um, they were building a new home. They were living in a really nice area of Sarasota, but they were building a new home and the home was torched and um, it was arson. And there were three different theories as to what had happened. Um, one was that it was just teenagers in the neighborhood that were bored. Uh, the second one was that, um, 
I got to think of what they considered the second. Um, oh, that it was the brother Tom because Tom wants the, it's much longer sort of intricate family drama, but he was off on his own and it kind of wasted millions of dollars on drugs, prostitutes, et cetera, even though he was still running dark energy. So they thought he was possibly getting back at Ken. And then the third theory was that Ken Dart had in, again, he, had, he was the investor. He invested and bought 4% of the Brazilian debt back, this is way back when. When Brazil wanted to kind of resolve all this, Ken was the one standout. He refused to negotiate. And in the end, he ended up making a cool $600 million on a $335 million investment. So the theory when I came to interview for this job was that, that Brazil was getting revenge on Ken. And I'm sitting there, I'm not kidding you, I'm sitting there in this interview going, are they, are they kidding? Are they about to say just kidding? Because like, I don't see a bunch of Brazilians like storming Sarasota, Florida to burn down a house. But that nonetheless was the theory of what was going on and then why they necessitated protection. Um, great, great family. Um, Ken then renounced his US citizenship for tax purposes and went to live in the Caymans. So I got a few trips with um, his wife and three daughters that were based in Sarasota there. Um, they had their own private uh, helicopter. Uh, I think they eventually got a plane, but after I left, they had um, a really nice yacht. Um, and we spent time, you know, we were three weeks on, three weeks off. Um, I ended up leaving this, if you don't mind me sharing a little dirt. Um, when we were three weeks on, three weeks off, that means we were two separate teams. We were called Blue and Gold. And um, they were breaking up our team. Again, you can read all about this in my book, but they were breaking up our team and the individual that was running the opposing team, I was supposed to be put under. And I knew him. I didn't know him when I was in the secret service, but he was also a former secret service agent. And what I knew about him, um, that he was a philanderer, uh, an alcoholic. Um, I heard rumors of that he was a, an abusive man. And I said, there's no way I will spend one day working under that man. So I quit. Um, so that ended my time there. I ended up going to Haiti after that. And then this, the Mary Kay family comes after that. So this will be a little bit out of order, but this is my fault. This is how I put the presentation together. I apologize. You can see Mary Kay Ash at the top. If you know anything about Mary Kay Cosmetics, the pink Cadillac, now they have all sorts of vehicles, but the pink Cadillac used to be the quintessential you know, Mary Kay sign, and it was in, it's based in Dallas, Texas. Um, I ended up working here, ended up being a year. Um, and then uh, it's when I came back from Haiti, I was going to graduate school, but I needed a couple more credits in psychology um, because I didn't undergrad in psychology. So I bought my time working with this family. It was the chairman of the board. His name was John Rashan and his family. Um, he was the chairman of the board and CEO of Mary Kay at the time. We also protected the then president, whose name was Amy DeGesso, who was a wonderful person. Um, she left, um, I forget where she's CEOing these days, but um, it was an interesting thing. They ended up having security, me and a whole team. Um, we were nine men and three women uh, because there was a disgruntled employee incident that I don't go into into the book because it's too private. Um, none of my um, stories in the book burn any of my clients. That's not about, it wasn't a tell all book, um, but it was a great one year. And John Rashan about a month, be I had already put in my resignation. And one morning he asked if I could drive him to work. I'm like, sure, it was unusual because usually the guys drove him and I was always with the wife and, and daughter. And he asked me if I would consider staying in Dallas and protecting his family and the company would pay for me to get my master's or my doctorate. And I said, you know, let me think about it. But when it came down to it, I really just wanted to focus on my studies. So I left um, and went to get my master's in forensic psychology. Um, so yeah, I'm good with this slide if you are, Sandy. For sure. So Haiti was in between these two. Um, fascinating, probably my toughest um, mission um, for a lot of reasons you can see. So if you look at the top left, the picture is of Jean Bertrand Aristide and then his successors, Rene Preval, who's in the top right. Um, uh, one, almost exactly one year before I went there, Aristide had, you know, there was a coup um, four or five years earlier. 
And he fled the country, went to France, ended up in the States. Um, he was in a really great hotel in Georgetown for many years. And through the Clinton administration, they decided that it was time to bring him back. And at the time, so this is 1994, I believe it was November, they thought it might be a potential warlike situation. So they put together a team of 21 former SEALs and former Special Forces Green Berets, that level of operator. One year later, when nothing happened, a lot, what I had heard, and I didn't, I only knew two of them because they, the only two that survived of the initial 21, what I heard is that there were a lot of chiefs and no Indians. And so really um, when it, when I came in a year later, we were then a team of 11, 10 men and me, uh, two of them were uh, surviving special forces medics. Um, so Haiti, if anybody knows this era, you know, 95, 96, um, not the safest place in the world. Um, however, you know, my challenge was more, if you can see that picture, these pictures, the one that's um, in the top middle and then the bottom left shows these massive, massive crowds. That was the biggest challenge um, of these people that just wanted to touch John Breton Aristide. Okay, he was a priest, he's a former priest. And they just thought that he, it, he was God. And we would sometimes have, have crowds of over 10,000. It was really, so you can see, you probably can't see really well, but that picture on the, the bottom left, that's John Bertrand Aristide, but on the, on the roof of a vehicle, because we could not protect him sometimes within these crowds because they would just swarm him. Um, some of the not so happy things um, in Haiti, if you look at that picture on the bottom right, that is, I saw witch burning. So they are believers in both voodoo and Catholicism. And within the realm of voodoo, they do believe that people are witches. So when I was in the palace, that's where we operate out of. Our command post was out of the palace. Um, you know, we'd go and we'd say, you know, I had one of my colleagues say, you know, Will, because that's my maiden name, you need to come with me. I have to show you something. I was like, okay. And we went to the North Gate and there were these, this person with tires thrown around them and they doused them with gasoline um, and lit them on fire. And I was like, well, aren't we supposed to do something about this? He goes, no, it's outside the presidential palace and it's not threatening the president. And I was like, I don't even know what to say to that. Um, and then the bottom picture, you can see all those skeletons. I hope this doesn't freak anybody out, but that was something we called the boneyard. It's an actual sort of um, very uh, organic uh, graveyard, but it was during the Papa Doc uh, Duvalier era. Um, a lot of them, and you can't see that here, but a lot of the bones and skulls still had clothing on them, sometimes some hair and shoes. Um, so that was a little bit um, daunting, a little bit haunting as well. Um, and the other thing, to be honest, why this was such a hard mission for me is, again, 10 men and me who many of them were none too happy when I was brought down. Um, was pretty brave of the detail leader to bring me down, but there were, we were also training the Haitians to take over our job to protect their own president. And many of them were women. And, and the head, the detail leader felt that they needed a woman to come down and be a role model. So it was, you know, I had a couple arguments with one particular individual who really didn't want me there, but I also worked with a lot of men who were allegedly happily married, but felt that uh, they would take advantage of the prostitutes that were rampant um, during that era. And some of them even had concubines. So I really got very jaded. Um, definitely about marriage. Um, that's why I didn't get married till after 40 years old. But uh, my mom used to say I was using that as an excuse, but um, it is what it is. And um, I left and that's, I was, I was one day sitting in the command post and I said to myself, you know what? I'm too flippin' smart for this industry. I gotta get the hell out of here and get myself into a master's program. So going back to that last slide, I went back to the States, found a forensic psychology program in New York City at John Jay College, but I didn't have enough psychology credits because I did not study psychology undergrad. So I worked with the Mary Kay family while I did my correspondence courses and got into the program. And so that's kind of how that ended for a while. So let me ask you about uh, this uh, experience in Haiti, especially given that security is all about uh, control of a situation and you know uh, understanding what the potential threats are. How in the world did you act as security in a scene, you know, such as the crowd storming, you know, around a car to try to get a you know a piece of the president? 
I have never had a more sort of what I would call aggressive or physical job than this one. Like you literally were shoving people out of the way. And I, we never had like an incident per se, but people just wanted to touch him. It was like this bizarre, I mean, people would come up to me as a tall white woman and just come up to me and literally go just like touch me. Like I was some ghost or something. It was like hard to understand the culture. So it, we literally would use physical force to keep them away. And I got to tell you, we used to fight to be the motorcade drivers because you were allowed to just crash anything out of the way because people just, it was, it's not like in the States when you have a motorcade and people get out of the way, it just didn't register there. So we used to um, fight to be um, <laughs> motorcade drivers so we could be pretty aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is a preview to the next slide. So if you guys recall, on July 15th of 1997, Andrew Cunanan, who's that slide on the, the picture on the right, killed Johnny Versace after killing four other people in the United States, kind of all over the states, you know, including coming through Chicago and killing Lee Miglin, who was a real estate mogul. And that picture at the bottom is John, or was Johnny Versace's um, home on South Beach and in Florida. So if you fast forward then to the next slide, please. Six months later in December, so remember, I'm going to graduate school and um, I, I left Dallas early enough where I could like go to New York and look for a place and I had time. And next thing I know, I get this phone call that says, hey, I got this job in New York City um, for you know one of those Hollywood types, are you up for it? And I was like, I gotta be honest. So this is when you're gonna learn something about me. I was a little bit of this elitist, you know, because I was like, I had the best training in the world. There's no way I'm ever going to like protect Hollywood people. It's just like professional babysitting, you know? And so um, when I talked to the guy, I did an interview over the phone with the head of the security company who was looking for a female. And when he told me what I was going to make per day, I was like, you know what? 30 days of that salary would not be a bad influx into my checking account before I start graduate school. So I agreed to do it. And my protectee was actually Allegra Versace. Um, I'm hoping you guys know who, who the Versaces are, you know, a huge Italian fashion house. Um, and Johnny, who got killed, was the whole, he was the brains and everything behind it, even though Donatella, his sister, and his brother both worked in different aspects, but really behind the scenes. It brought Donatella, who was Allegra's mother, way to the forefront. And what happened here is Allegra, at 11 years old, became what was coined the second most kidnappable kid in the world Whoa. next to the, I know, next to the Onassis granddaughter, Athena. Um, and so, because Johnny, uh, when he died, he left her a whopping $450 million. So um, yeah, she was my charge and I worked with other people. And I gotta tell you, I thought, oh, this is gonna be a breeze. 11 year old in New York City, like no big deal. I tell you what, I was the earliest to get there and the latest to get home. Like I'd get home at say 11 or 12 and I'd be like, oh, where's Joe? Because Joe was protecting Donatella. They're like, oh, Joe's been home for hours. Donatella came home hours ago. And I was like, what the hell? Like I have an 11 year old, what is going on, right? So I did meet Sting, you can see his picture at the top. One of the funniest stories at the bottom right, so there's the Madonna, Rosie O'Donnell friendship. And Donatella, uh, this is back again in 97, and I think this is when Madonna had just adopted her first daughter. And we went, Donatella and Allegra went, we both, did, and our security people went to go visit Madonna, give her jewels, et cetera. Donatella leaves, and I stay with Allegra with Madonna. Madonna says, okay, we're gonna go now to Rosie O'Donnell's house because I think she had just adopted a child. So we walked the streets of New York and it was a, it was a, I'm sorry, excuse my French. It was a shit show, like paparazzi everywhere. And I said, um, Madonna, um, I have a card here that was shadowing us. That's what they do because they want to make sure if something happens, I can evacuate with Allegra. You know, we have a card here. Why don't we? She's like, oh, fuck the press. There are a bunch of vultures. And I was like, you're with an 11 year old, like really? But I feel in hindsight that she really wanted, you know, that sort of attention because she was close to Johnny and whatever. So as we walk, we get to Rosie O'Donnell's um, condo complex and we walk in and she says to the doorman, she's like, you know, he's got his little desk and she's like, oh, we're here to see Rosie O'Donnell. And this is the best ever. I'm sorry. This is funny. She, the, the doorman goes to her and you would be, and she goes, Madonna. <laughs> and 
I got to tell you, the other doorman looks at me and goes, dude, I can't believe you just asked her that. And I was like, God, that made my day. Like, you know, a little bit of humility um, would have been nice. So that was my, um, that was my uh, interesting thing. And I got to, and I normally don't tell this story, but I, once it came out public, I was actually with Allegra when she was diagnosed with anorexia. Uh, as you can see, I mean, that's a somewhat modern photo on the left there in that blue dress. She's still struggling. I mean, she, she's, she's had a go of it. I mean, I was protect, protecting her when she was 11 and she's 35 now. Um, so I think she's still struggling, but she was a total sweetheart and everybody was really awesome. I'm good if you are, Sandy. For sure. So, I go get my master's in forensic psychology. I move to San Diego and I'm working in the field of stalking um, or I should say anti-stalking. And so this is, I end up getting my degree at the end of 1999. So called a year and something later to almost two years later, 9-11 happens. I call the Red Cross in New York City and I say, would like to donate my services. You know, if there's crisis, people that need crisis counseling, et cetera. They said, thank you so much, but we have an overabundance. Here's a couple more agencies that might need your help. I called for a, but we have an overabundance of volunteers. Okay. Well, um, interestingly to me, um, the summer before 9-11, I had been offered to do, uh, to be an instructor, uh, VIP protection team in the anti-terrorism assistance program because they were expanding and they were moving the main headquarters from Washington, DC to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I went and checked it out. I went to Albuquerque that summer. I was traveling in the Southwest anyway. And I was like, sure, why not? It's three weeks of work. It'll be super interesting. I mean, I could use a break from, you know, just all the work in the anti-stalking realm. So I agreed to do it. And then 9-11 happens and we were supposed to start the first week of October. And so I didn't think it was going to happen, but it did. And our first a uh, group that we trained was from Bangladesh. And the whole ATA program, which is the anti-terrorism assistance program, it falls under the US Department of State. And that top right photo is of the Marine barracks bombing. I don't know if anybody remembers, but it was 1983 and about 247 US military were killed. And that's when the program started. It's just with time really expanded. And so for a year and a half, um, I worked in Albuquerque three weeks out of the month because that's how long the VIP protection training went. And we brought in what we called friendly foreign nationals. Um, and I kind of put quotes around that because, you know, some of the vetting wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, but it is what it is. And so I trained somewhere around 17 different countries of individuals that protected their number one. So that could have been a king, a prime minister, a president. Um, and one of my teammates, we were five instructors, one of my teammates sold me for 500 cows to a Bangladeshi colonel. So you can read about that in the book too. It was insane. You're worth at least 600. <laughs> <laughs> it was this crazy thing. And I mean, he really believed that it was possible. And when he was leaving the airport, um, he said, Mary, if you want to reconsider, I'm still willing. And I was like, I was my I was like wanting to kill my teammate that did that. <laughs> it's a great story, but you can read the full story in the um, in the book. Next slide. Yeah, please. Okay, so this was a transition uh, from working in the ATA program to one of my colleagues had left, and he went to Columbia to do a security assessment and ended up taking a position running the presidential security team. At the time, he was a team of one. This is where it all started, because if we, if you guys don't know, um, Columbia was a huge ally to us post 9-11. Um, lots of classified stuff there, but it's suffice it to say that President Alvaro Uribe, who's the man in this picture and the man shaking George Bush Jr.'s hand, um, was the person that, you know, Put, put his hand out to us. And there was a conference, this is where they were shaking hands. And Bush says to Alvaro Uribe, is there anything we can do to help? And he's like, well, my, my protection team could really use some training. And George Bush looked at Condoleezza Rice and says, what can we do? She goes, we can give them ATA training. So they brought for the first time ever, we had such a waiting list for the program that nobody was ever allowed to do more than one group of 18. We had eight, between 18 and 24 trainees at the time. 
um, we allowed five groups of Colombians to come through the program. I was there for three of them before I transitioned into going to Colombia. If you don't mind going to the next slide. So, so the, the, my original position, I was told when I was being um, interviewed to go here that you're gonna be protecting the Minister of Defense, that's MOD. And I was like, okay, awesome. Well, I get there. So I, on my very first day of work, I'm in the embassy and I'm waiting to, I'm in the ambassador's office. And it was Ann Patterson at the time, if anybody knows her, she's pretty well known in the community. She's awesome. And the Minister of Defense at the time was a woman, but this is a man, she, retired, she resigned a few months later. But I am waiting for the ambassador and she comes in and she says, Okay, Mary Beth, so um, you know, you'll be protecting the Minister of Defense, um, the Vice President, and the Mayor of Bogota. And I'm listening to all of this, right? And I have this motto of never let him see you sweat, but I'm in my head going, are you effing kidding me? You told me I'm coming here to protect the Minister of Defense, not the Minister of Defense and the Vice President and the Mayor of Bogota. Like, what the heck is going on? And then eventually, on my second meeting with her, she's like, Mary Beth. I know that Marta Lucia, that's, that was the Minister of Defense at the time, Marta Lucia Ramirez, I know she's a full-time job. Just do this for a month or two, write me a cable, and I promise you I will get you another advisor. So my official title became U.S. Security Advisor to the Minister of Defense of Colombia, um, and I worked under the auspices of the security office in the, the embassy in Bogota. And, um, and, and why, let me interrupt you, why, how come Colombia didn't have the capacity to do that job itself? Yeah, well, first of all, um, here's how their secret service work, works. It, there's no secret service. So in other words, President Uribe had been um, a senator, then a mayor. He had all different um, positions prior to. And when he got the presidency, just like the vice president, they brought in people they trusted. It could, have been, it could have been a taxi driver from Medellin. It didn't matter. They brought in people they could trust. There was no institutional knowledge. There was no training. They had our training in Albuquerque, but it was like the first training they'd ever really had. I mean, the guards at the palace, and I shouldn't say this because I hope it's changed, but they didn't even have any rounds in their, in their weapons hmm. because they didn't know how to shoot them. It was all for show. So the whole idea was to create this sort of institutional knowledge and keep the, and we kept doing refresher courses to keep them like, you know, cause that our job was, you know, we were security advisors. So it wasn't like when I traveled with the minister of defense or the vice president that I was actually behind them protecting them. I was observing what was being done. And then we determined what they would need. Like we bought armored vehicles for them. We bought weapons, we bought radios. We even bought like office furniture. So here in this picture, I am training with the head of security for the Minister of Defense. Um, and then the actual um, Minister of Defense is on the right. Um, he replaced Marta Lucia Ramirez when she resigned. And then the next slide is probably just more training, I think. Yeah, this is firearms training. Um, and then one of my colleagues there. And then I don't, I think the next one is more training too, Sandy. Yeah, so we also did, you know, driving training. Um, that's me at the top middle, um, torturing my students. I was always in charge of the physical fitness training. Um, and I think they thought, oh, great. In the beginning, I thought, they thought that's gonna be great. It's a woman, no big deal. And then at, by the end of <laughs> uh, the three weeks, I think they wanted to, to die, but I got them in decent shape. Um, defensive tactics is on the bottom left. And then that top left picture is us um, shooting at vehicles, tossing, you know, what were like supposed to be like bombs. So it was really just smoke bombs and stuff to make it simulate um, an actual attack. So I'm good with that too, Sandy. Uh, so how are we on time, Sandy? We're good, keep, yeah, keep going. We'll yeah. go to Q and A in maybe five, five minutes or so, everyone. This is perfect then, the timing is great. So this is, I told you, I also had a lot of really interesting investigations and what was unique about my style of investigating was that, um, with the exception of this investigation in the private sector, um, not including my time in the Secret Service as an investigator, but I never told anybody I was investigating them except for this case. Um, so I was the type of person who, this will make you paranoid because it used to make me paranoid, but I find a seat on a plane because I needed to talk to somebody um, for an investigation or I ended up getting an American Airlines um, club pass because somebody, uh, paid our investigative agency to send me to observe um, people 
particular individual they thought had a drinking problem. They were concerned because he was having meetings in this club and they wanted me to observe to see whether he was drinking or not and his behavior and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I moved into a house, I won't say what city. Um, I moved into a house and befriended some neighbors because the people that hired me need, needed information from them. So again, that was my style of investigation. Now this investigation, if you guys remember in 2006, um, the Duke lacrosse scandal, um, I ended up working an investigation for uh, 60 minutes. It was Ed Bradley, God rest his soul. He's no longer on this earth, but he did a segment on this and he wanted us to find that woman there you see. So if you remember, it was two strippers um, with the Duke lacrosse team. The, the lacrosse team never denied that they had strippers, but they did deny that they raped the woman there that was, whose name was Crystal Gale Magnum. Um, there was also another woman, her name was Kim Roberts, um, but she never made allegations of rape. Um, so they wanted us to find them. And interestingly, our dear DA, who's right there, his name is Mike Nifong, who ended up being disbarred after this, by the way. Um, he, uh, every time he needed to speak to those girls or it was a court date, the girls would show up. But when any of the defendants, the lacrosse players were looking for them, they just magically couldn't be found. The interesting thing about this, um, Crystal Magnum, who you see there, um, she had a sister who uh, researched through the library. Um, we know exactly what library, we know exactly what computer, um, the wealthiest zip codes on the lacrosse team. And that's when, you know, Crystal, who was making the allegations of rape, she changed her story several times saying, I can't remember. They all look the same. They're all white lacrosse players. And, and really, quite frankly, many of them kind of did look very similar, but it's all to say that the theory was that she changed several times once her sister got the information to her about who are the wealthiest team members. And Reed Seligman was one of those, and it was a it was a poor pick, and I'll tell you why. Um, unfortunately, his parents ended up spending over a million dollars on his defense, but he had the tightest alibi. He had he had gone in he had gotten a cab. He had gone through a drive-through window. They remembered him. All of these things were time-stamped. Uh, the, the taxi driver remembered him. They knew when he got home, et cetera, et cetera. So he could not have been at the place where Crystal claimed that she had been raped by him. So if you guys remember, that was also a total, total shit show. It ruined a lot of people's lives. The coach got fired. A lot of these kids were going on to jobs that they lost. Um, it turned out that um, it wasn't true that uh, Mike Nifong supposedly might have held over some, like I had heard rumors that Crystal wanted to retract her statement and change it, but that Mike, Mike Nifong was running for office that year, kind of held over her head, do this for me or I'll take your kids away from you. Um, it's all to say that Crystal Magnum, by the way, I have this notes here, uh, November 22nd, 2013, she actually was convicted of second degree murder and she's currently serving 18 years in prison. So sad ending, but she really destroyed a lot of people's lives. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The inside scoop of this was just incredible. The amount of money that was spent to defend those boys. Yeah, and so sad. this was a slightly different assignment for you in the sense that you were investigating as opposed to protecting. Yeah, and I did, I really flip-flopped a lot. I, you know, I, I didn't put a lot of them in there. Um, that could be a whole other talk, but um, this is the one, you know, that I think is interesting because it was a 60 minutes investigation for Ed Bradley, but, you know, um, pretty high profile that, that was out in the country, right? Um, it was pretty interesting. And we did find them for Ed Bradley, by the way. Um, we found um, Kim uh, working in a Domino's pizza, right? She's a stripper, but she was working. So she was being hidden, right? She was doing low key. Um, I'm not really supposed to talk about how we found Crystal, but we did. Um, and Ed Bradley was able to interview them and do his story. Well, wow. yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating in all the wrong ways of being fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To get a little bit of the scoop about what really happened, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Next slide. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the last slide. So if you remember post 9-11, I worked in the anti-terrorism assistance program as an instructor. And what this part of my life was, this was like 2006 to 2012, um, including some of the time during the time I was getting my 
my doctorate, like I would work um, these assignments in the summer. But this was almost like the, the pre-training. In other words, they would send out teams of people to do assessments of the capabilities within the countries. And then they would decide what they needed. And so that's when all those people would come through when I was in Albuquerque and did VIP training. That's because somebody had gone to that country and determined that those countries needed VIP protection training. So from 2006 to 2012, I had this amazing experience of going to places like Jordan, Argentina, Libya, Mozambique, um, Palestine, um, Paraguay, et cetera. And I did those assessments of their VIP protection capabilities, their critical infrastructure capabilities, their airport security capabilities. And then I would write reports saying what their capabilities were and what I thought we could offer them um, you know, as the United States. So it was sort of like the reverse, right? Um, and by that time, the side that I had worked before as an instructor was going mobile. So they were going to the countries and it was very rare because they had really reduced the budget on that. So it was really cool for me to be involved in this facet of it and travel to these countries as opposed to just sitting in the United States and training them. So I think that's it, Sandy. <clears throat> Wonderful. Oh, and there's a slide of your book. You want to you wanna talk, about the, <laughs> talk about the book for a minute? Sure. Yeah. So I got to be honest, when I, when I first sat down to write this book, uh, it was going to be a, just about my previous life, meaning um, my life as a Secret Service agent. And then when I left and I did this flip-flopping between investigations and protection. And when I started writing, I went chapter by chapter, um, starting with protection. You know, I had all my kind of chapter outlines and I wrote so many pages just on the protection side that it became its own book. So um, I think if I ever get, uh, I still, I do have an outline for my next book, which would be all my investigations, but I haven't started writing that yet. I just have to kind of get in that mode because, you know, as I say, I'm not a writer. I just have a story to tell. Um, so this book was published actually almost exactly a year ago. So the timing of this is great. And it's Ooh. called The Protector, A Woman's Journey from the Secret Service to Protecting VIPs in the World's Most Dangerous Places. And it could be found on Amazon. Right on. Well, thank you. Well, yeah. um, folks, it's, uh, it would be great to have some questions. And I certainly have a couple uh, just based on our, our conversation just now. Um, and I guess the first one is, you know, you talked about a macho culture uh, in Peru, and I'm sure there's many other countries that would fit that bill, but so would the Secret Service, I would imagine, have a fairly robust macho culture within it. Tell us a little bit about being a woman in that particular culture and, uh, and how that kind of, you know, helped, helped shape you. Yeah, um, you know, I, I was telling Sandy this earlier, I said, you know, I walked into a, a profession, or rather I barged into a profession that was very, very male dominated. So, you know, my expectations, I feel were sort of tempered. I felt like I didn't expect people to, you know, you know, throw their arms out and welcome me. I knew that there was going to be some of this macho attitude. Um, I had been what they call an explorer in my local um, law enforcement, local police um, area. This is where people that want to be involved in law enforcement and the local police kind of guide you and they, you know, you get to do ride alongs with them and they give you training and stuff like that. So I kind of had an idea. And when I was in training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center down in Glencoe, Georgia for the Secret Service, um, most of my training colleagues were pretty cool, but there was one Secret Service guy who subsequently got himself fired. But you know, um, he, he got so irritated by me. At one point he says to me, what are you even doing here? Why don't you just leave? And of course I proceed to just laugh and that pissed him off even more. But you know, it was just one of those things where there were, there were guys that just didn't feel that women belonged. I mean, it used to be a culture of what they said, booze, broads, and Buicks, and we ruined that, you know? And so, you know, my whole mentality was kind of keep your nose down, do your job, and you'll prove yourself, and that's how it happened. And I will say, Sandy, that, um, and, and I hope it's changed, but, you know, I kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed to go to these women agent meetings. They would meet once a month. And I was kind of like, oh, I don't really think that's for me. I think it's not really going to be healthy. I just, I kind of had my preconceived notion of what it was. And I finally said, okay, listen, I'm going to go to this month's meeting because I'm kind of sick of them, you know, haranguing me to go. And I'm going to see what it's about. And I got to be honest, it was exactly what I thought. And I never went back again, because for me, it was at the time, and I really hope it's changed. Um, 
it was that sort of negative of what we aren't getting, what's being done to us, as opposed to like, what are the positives and whatever. So I thought, you know what, for me, it doesn't, it's not healthy to sit in a meeting to bitch about what I'm not getting. I just want to do my job. And I had, for me, even though it was a little bit over a year, I had an amazing year. I was a Spanish speaker. They yanked me all over the place. I was the only Spanish speaker in the Washington field office. Um, so I was busier than you kind of, I mean, I was doing undercover assignments. I was doing raids, um, interviews different than most of my colleagues. So I really enjoyed it. And I thought there were way, 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 way more pros than there were cons being a female. So given that you've done a lot of training around the world as well, if a, a young woman comes to you and says, Mary Beth, I'm really interested in becoming, you know, part of the secret service or into the security, you know, sort of business, what would your, what would your advice be? Yeah. And, and honestly, I have, um, I teach right now at George Washington University. I teach um, abnormal psychology and the psychology of crime and violence. And I hold career days on Saturdays, um, like once a month during the semester, because inevitably somebody either wants to be a, doc, uh, a psychologist or somebody wants to be a federal agent. So I have introduced so many students, many, many females, to colleagues right now that are still in federal agencies or that are local cops so that they can get an idea of what it's like. And, and you know, that I'm long gone from the agency. So I'll say to them, absolutely apply it. The, yeah, the, the, I read your book and, you know, I thought you wouldn't want me to be an agent. I said, I absolutely, that's for you to decide. I think it's a great agency. I think there's a lot of great federal agencies, but you know, use, use the fact that you're a female to your advantage. They're going to, they want to hire us. It's just that we're leaving, but they want to hire us. So, you know, you're a female, take advantage of those aspects that will get you ahead of somebody else in the line. So we talk a lot about, you know, what do the different agencies do? Um, what are, what, what interests you? Not that I just, cause everyone thinks the FBI is the only agency out there. Like a lot of times I want to be an FBI agent. I'm like, what about NCIS? What about state department? What about, what about, there's like a hundred different agencies. There's Homeland Security. So, you know, you have to find what fits your style, not just prestige. So we talk a lot about that. Question here from Donna Miles. She says, you've worked in some of the most dangerous places and then, and have been able to avoid ever having to use lethal force to accomplish your goals. What principles or practices would you recommend law enforcement officers could adopt to reduce the number of incidents lethal force has to be used? Yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, training. You know, we always say we train for the worst and hope for the best. Um, you know, the bad guy only has to be spot on once. We have to be on all the time. And so I think it's not only that the agency provides the training, it's the mentality of the individuals in the agency. In other words, you know, I was one of those people to, to this day, I'm still a workout fanatic. I have not given up that mentality of how much of an advantage being in good shape can be. And I'm 55 years old. I'm still, I'm still working out five to seven days a week because it so affects my, my mental as much as it does my physical. It's so intertwined and it's such an advantage um, that I would say, you know, going back to what Donna is ultimately asking, it has to do with training, because if you're not training, man, does you do your skills de deplete? These are depreciable skills. I mean, you know, when I think about back in the day of like, you know, the defensive tactics and the gun takeaways and the arrests and everything that you practice, 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 you know, it's what is my mentality and how am I going to keep it up? So I feel, Donna, it's both ways. It's the agency providing the training and the mentality of the individual to want to stay up on their skills. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, question here from Herb Thomas. Now that social media is so influential and, and often troublesome, does VIP protection increasingly involve a sort of back office, not active prote protectors that searches the web full time to evaluate threats and so on? Absolutely. Um, and I'm way more informed on that because a lot of my friends, meaning um, of the people in Hollywood, uh, because I had, I still do a little bit of consulting in the stalking field um, and none more than Hollywood is, uh, you know, kind of high profile and a couple of um, former colleagues work in that area. And so that's, I got to be honest, like I studied stalking and I'm an expert, but I am not an expert in cyber stalking. That kind of came right when I was getting my degree as far as it being a thing. And I'm not a tech guru, but I understand the way like people have, I have sat in on talks um, of people forewarning parents and then also teenagers of how much of an imprint you're making and how you think you delete stuff, but it doesn't go away. 
So when someone's being stalked or if somebody say uh, threatening the president, oh my God, in a day, they have a massive profile on them, including what you were asking about, which is all their social media. It, they just scrub it. And, and don't think that you delete stuff. It's not, it's not ever deleted. That's the scary part. Right. The internet doesn't forget. <laughs> it does not. It does not. And these oh. kids just don't realize that what they're creating, right? Right. So what, and what I know, do you have I to... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah. no. I was just saying, like, I don't want to be that old fuddy-duddy, you know, like old kids, they don't know. But it's like when you think about the impact and maybe you couldn't get a job because of something you posted, right? I, I just would hate for that to happen. Right. Comment here from uh, Virginia McCallum. She said she smiled because the male asking you what you were doing in the training course are the exact same words I heard from professors when I was in graduate uh, school for a higher degree in history. One of two women uh, in cool. one of the uh, universities, we were both frequently asked what we were doing because no one would ever hire a woman with a PhD <laughs> in history. Those jobs were for men. <laughs> That's awesome. Go you, Susan. <laughs> Yeah, happily, we're in a very different time right now, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, there's, and I don't know if you feel the same way, Susan, but I feel like there were a lot more pros and cons where I don't think I would ever state. Yes, there were challenges, but um, I kind of liked it. You know, I was always a tomboy. I always kind of like, you know, had that sort of, you know, jock, you know, challenging guy thing. Um, and, you know, that never let him see you sweat thing, it worked for me. Yeah. Um, so what are what are what are you up to now? What's what's next for you? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know whether I'll be continuing teaching because, by the way, um, I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, a year ago, and like right literally when COVID hit, March the nineteenth, we moved here because I was teaching at that time abnormal psychology, and they told the students when you leave for spring break in a couple of days, you're not coming back because we're shutting down. So my husband and I had bought a house here in January and we were going to move in June. And I looked at him, I was like, well, let's get off the East Coast. It's probably going to be a shit show, which is kind of the way it started. But then they ended up opening up and being more open in general quicker than us. But it's all to say that I ended up teaching two more semesters unexpectedly. I thought that was going to be my last semester, but they've been 100% online for the last two semesters. And I normally teach the psychology of crime and violence in the fall. Um, and I just, I've had a communication with the head of the psychology department and let her know my situation. Now, what I've said is I am willing to teach a hybrid type class. So that would mean me committing to at least one week out of the month in person, which I said I would do, um, but they really don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, right now they're planning to be fully in person, um, which I, I, I gotta be honest, I, I've told my students this, I hope this is my last semester teaching there because I really want them to be in person. I really want them to get back to normal life, as normal as that, the new normal, right? The new normal. So I don't know. Um, I still consult. I still, I have a whole slew of clients that I um, counsel. Um, I do mental health trainings. Uh, I do speaking engagements like this. Um, if I'm not teaching, I'm not really sure that might give me the room to start my second book. <laughs> good. Well, last yeah. question here from Philippa Klesig. She says, you know, you have the confidence and knowledge, obviously, to do your job. How do you personally boost confidence in the people you train? How do I, what confidence in the people I train? How do you personally boost confidence in Got the people it. that you train? Yeah, great question. And this is where sometimes when I look back on my life, I kind of go, there's this sort of string that's pulled through every facet, meaning, you know, one of the things that they put on, that we have on my website is that I'm a self-esteem mentor, okay? Kind of synonymous, but not exactly to confidence. And my whole dissertation getting my doctorate was um, creating a protocol, a cognitive behavioral protocol, 13 sessions on how to increase self-esteem in young women. So my whole thing is it's very, 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 very cognitive behavioral. Stop, stop the negative thinking, stop the negative criticism. We can be hard on ourselves, but criticizing ourselves is not helpful. Um, so one of the most salient memories I have of watching women that didn't think they belonged was actually me pushing my male colleagues on the female students in Columbia on the firearms range because my male colleagues were phenomenal and treated them like equals and then were super, super supportive. And if it came from me, it would have been like, oh, Mary Beth feels sorry for me. She's a woman, whatever. But I wanted it to come from my male colleagues so they felt like they had this, you know, this 
super strength and that they belong there. And my whole goal in working with anybody and boosting their self-confidence is letting them know that they belong, that as females in particular, because a lot of times we're told we, we don't. Um, listen, I was told I didn't. It was like, oh yeah, tell me I can't and I will bust through that wall and I'll show you I can. So that's a little bit of me, but I help sort of foment that, that style of thinking. You belong, you are equally as good, if not better. And I would say that for a lot of women, we're better protectors. Well, very well put, very well put. Um, Dr. Mary Beth Janke, thank you so much for uh, all of your amazing insights. That presentation was absolutely fascinating. And uh, oh, I look thanks forward to time. meeting you one of these days. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, me too. Great to see you in your suit and tie today. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. Well, yeah, thank um, you everybody for attending. I really appreciate it. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can go to my website and send me an email. It's drmarybeth.com. Right on. Well, thank you. And, and we'll send on some information to folks as well if they want to uh, check out your book or, or your website and so on. So uh, awesome. once again, thank you so much. And uh, everyone out there, we will see you tomorrow when we have Ambassador Derek Mitchell talking all about what's going on in Myanmar. Until then, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andy.